the, the place where I'm working, this is a beautiful, no, nothing to brag, and uh, this is a fantastic place. The most important thing is this building, which this is a building architecture. If you have seen the cheese, uh, Swiss cheese, it has a lot of holes. That the architect has converted into a very nice building. It's our library, and this has got the very nice price. So just want to mention that building and the Swiss culture as a cheese. So now I come back to the topic. Just read this one, silicon solar cell efficiency 25.3, and that's taken from the NREL chart. The perovskite solar cell efficiency 23.3, Chinese Academy of Science, they have reported certified. The commercial silicon solar modules, their efficiencies, even though you have a 25.3% efficiency, the most of the modules, depending on the supplier, they don't go beyond, say, 20% efficiency. However, perovskite solar cells, we are reaching very close to the silicon solar cell efficiency. But the problem between the silicon solar cells and perovskite solar cell is stability. And the stability is the biggest criteria for this technology. So since we are working in this new technology and it is easy to fabricate, and many countries can start and PhD students can start on this topic and come up with the new materials. This is a huge opportunity for developing new materials on the perovskite material, on the perovskite topic. You will see in my presentation some ideas as I go on, I give you some take home messages, some, uh, some interesting thoughts where you can build on your PhD or some other uh, topics. So in order to give you some prospect of what is perovskite solar cell, I have destacked the perovskite solar cell into different layers. Basically, the perovskite solar cell has a three main components. One, what we call electron transport layer, and that's a, this one, TaO2 acts as electron transport layer. And the main component, that's a, the perovskite, that's an absorber. And now you have a whole transporting material on top of uh, perovskite. Now, what happens is, when you shine the light, and the perovskite immediately it creates charges, positive and negative. So in most of the material, this by creating the charges, they go like an ion pair. This is called what we call exciton bind exciton. And to dissociate this exciton, positive and negative charge, you have to give some energy. And this is extremely high energy depending on the materials. But the beauty of the perovskite materials is when you excite at room temperature, the moment it sees the photons, you already have your carriers. That's a positive and negative charges. They travel like a highways. What you have to do is, at the interface, you collect these charges, and that's the reason why it's so efficiently working and giving you high efficiency. So I have destacked this one, and I try to, um, it's very difficult to cover all these topics, but I have given you some indications so that um, you, you will get some ideas. So what we will do, as a solvent engineering of perovskite layers. So here I have to mention, there are only few labs who can get more than 20% efficiency. Even though there are more than 500 labs working, 10,000 publications, most of the efficiencies are below 20% efficiency. Why this is happening? And this is because the way you process what we call solvent engineering, this is a very important step. That's the reason why I included two slides on uh, solvent engineering. And then you have a interface engineering. So as I mentioned, you create the charges, but these charges also can recombine at these interfaces. The devices of perovskite is nothing but interfaces. What you see is here, so I create one interface between the whole transporting material and the perovskite. This is uh, one interface. There's another interface uh, that's between the perovskite and electron transport layer. So these are the two interfaces which you have to control in order to get the high efficiency and stability. Then I have a compositional engineering of perovskite. I will, next slide you will see what is perovskite and how we are going to com engineer the, its composition. Then I have a, another interesting topic which probably I will have to run it. It's a called whole transporting material, that's a top layer. That's the commercial stuff is not very stable. So you have to develop your own whole transporting material and here for the organic professors, organic students, it's a huge opportunity to develop these materials with the functionalities of these materials. So that's the reason I have included a few slides on the whole transporting materials. If time permits, I give you uh, all this uh, material. So let's come back to the perovskite. What is perovskite actually? And take the silicon solar, it's a simple compound, monotonic silicon. And in the perovskite, we are having a three uh, components, A, B, X. So A is a monocation. This monocation can be um, cesium or, or methylammonium or formidinium. And you have a B as a dication. In this case, we are working with lead. 
this can be tin. The tin is not very stable because it immediately undergoes to oxidation. And now you have a X as a halide. It can be chloride, bromide, iodide. So now you have an enormous opportunity to tune its properties. That's the reason I have mentioned here at the tunable band gap. So I can tune the band gap of this material either by changing the cation, you will see some slides, or by changing the halide. So this way you have a opportunity of depending on the requirements of the building's integration, you can have a different colors. The strong absorption in the whole visible region. Silicon solar cells they absorb between 400 to 1.2 micrometers, 1,200 nanometers. Perovskite solar cells they absorb only 400 to 800 nanometers. You will see in the next slide. As I mentioned already, the small excitation dissociation energy that's as small as 30 milli electron volts. So this is the beauty of the perovskite materials, and this particular property is making this material very efficient. So this is the slide showing the absorption factor properties. You can see the perovskite absorbs the whole visible region, and it has a very sharp onset. What does it mean by sharp onset? This onset is a property of the material. You have a low defect. Let's take this one. The property of the material which has a low defect. And with this low defect, and you get carriers at the interfaces. So now I come back to the devices. So there are, in the literature, there are several architectures. Here I have highlighted. Uh, the best one, that's a, um, this one, NIP mesoporous. This one, mesoporous, and this is a without a TO2 layer. So these are the two NIP architectures, depending on the, uh, the light which you are coming. So electron extraction site is a N, and the intrinsic perovskite, and P is a whole transmitting material. So this is the configuration which the Chinese has reported 23.3. Uh, and here in this configuration, Yesterday, somebody was asking in the audience for the, the TO2 was not a very good material. It may have a stability problem. So the solution is, can we remove the TO2? Yes, of course, you can remove the TO2. You can remove the TO2, and it's called planar perovskite solar cell. And this one gives you slightly lower efficiency, close to 22%. You will see the certified data, which I will share with you. And the other one is PIN configuration. So PIN configuration, first you deposit the whole transporting material, followed by perovskite, followed by ETL. So these are the three dominant configurations in the literature. I come back to the solvent engineering. So you can make the perovskite solar cells, but the efficiencies are very low. How to increase the efficiency? So if you go back to the cross-sectional image of a best performing solar cell, what you see here is that this is a compact layer of TO2. And you have a very thin layer of mesoporous layer between 150 to 200 nanometers. Then you have a 500 nanometers over layer thickness. That's a perovskite over layer. Controlling this over layer is very important because when you increase the, this thickness, you can absorb more, more light and that gives you more current. And this is the important property. So how do you control this thickness? The perovskite has a, another interesting property. Most of the materials when you dissolve, it solubilizes at, by increasing the temperature. That's the inverse situation with the perovskite. As you increase the temperature, you start precipitating. So you're doing two things in one shot. By heating the, your perovskite solution, you're precipitating. By putting the anti-solvent on top of the perovskite solution, you're enhancing the crystal growth. And that's the reason why you get this 200, 500 nanometers overlay thickness. So people who can manipulate this, uh, the two processes, heating and precipitation by solvent pinching, can get over 20% efficiency. So what type of solvent you should use? So we have a different solvent screen. I will not go into the details. So the take home message is, you need a high boiling solvent and a miscible in your perovskite solution. What is your perovskite solution? You take your methyl ammonium iodide and lead iodide in DMS or DMF, and then this sol solution the anti-solvent has to be miscible and a high boiling point. These are the two criteria. And if you have a low boiling solvent like an ether, you can see the crystals are not very good. When you have a high boiling solvent like a trifluorotolvin, tolvin, or benzene, you can see micrometer size crystals growth. So these are the two parameters. So the efficiency is having a trifluorotolvin, you can get 20% efficiency. As you go down with the ether, you have a lower efficiency. These are the uh, the data, it's not a one cell based data, it's a 20, average of 25 cells, and the data is reported as shown. So now I come back to the uh, perovskite, that's interface engineering between the perovskite and whole transporting material. So another take home message, 
when you are having a perovskite composition, you may be using a stoichiometric ratio. That is a lead iodide versus your organic compound, methyl ammonium iodide, any other. That is called a stoichiometric ratio. Never use stoichiometric ratio. It has to be non stoichiometric ratio. That what does it mean by non stoichiometric ratio? When you are making these compositions, you should have a, at least a 10 percent excess of lead iodide with respect to your organic cation. And with this non stoichiometric ratio, what you are having is you will left over with some excess lead iodide as shown here. This is just a cartoon. Just imagine that you have a perovskite solution, you, dip, you spin coated, you have a excess unreacted lead iodide. So, I want to make use of this excess unreacted lead iodide by putting a another layer of perovskite. So, what I do? So, I just take the perovskite solution, uh, anti solvent, you have a perovskite overlay thickness, and on the top, you have a unreacted lead iodide. Now, I come up with a a formidinium bromide. This is a another organic uh, material and this formidinium bromide reacts with this lead iodide, excess lead iodide into your system and it forms a new perovskite layer. So, now I have created a, a thin layer of a passivation layer on top of my three dimensional perovskite. This can be another perovskite, but this has a different properties. So, this is a, a cartoon showing after conversion of excess lead iodide into a new perovskite and the same image, the top image shows that you have a this measure. But you need the experimental proof to show that you are having that one. So, now let us take the uh, geometry or uh, the structural characterization. This is your TO2 which is acting as the electron transport layer. This is your perovskite. This is newly created your um, perovskite uh, interlayer between the whole transport material and the perovskite. Question is what is this doing? So, the, the, the answer is when you create charges within the perovskite, the holes fortunately the homo level of this new perovskite and then the perovskite is well aligned. So, there is no barrier to extract positive charges into your whole transport material. On the contrary, look at the lumo level of your new material that has a higher band gap and that it forces your electrons directing towards to go towards the TO2 layer. And this way you create uh, more charges and reduce the recombination significantly. How do we know that one? Let us take the data here. So, this is the IV characteristics which we usually do. This is as prepared film without any interlayer and here you have a deposited interlayer right? that gives you higher efficiency and the optimized efficiency is 21.3. Now, just to go back to the previous slide, the difference between 1.1, 1.16 for you it looks nothing, but for us it is an achievement because we have increased 60 millivolts by creating this interlayer. Okay? That is the beauty of this material. Now, here is the question, can we change this material to a functionalized material? So, you can immediately think some other materials, for example, two dimensional material. The two dimensional materials, that is a new topic again. So, what is two dimensional material? So, your perovskite is a three dimensional material like this one all interconnected. In the perovskite, you have a, a cavity. That cavity takes a particular cation size. This cation size has to be 0 0.8 to 1. If the size of the cation is bigger than this smaller cation, then you slice the perovskite into uh, two dimensional perovskite. That is what is happening here. So, I have listed here different cations and this is different cations slices your perovskite into two dimensional material. So, what happens is the properties is shown here. Three dimensional perovskite, beautiful absorption goes up to 800 nanometers. Two dimensional perovskite, I say below 550 nanometers. Why I am using this then? So, here the two dimensional perovskite has a high stability compared to three dimensional perovskite. Now, what I want to do is combine this two dimensional perovskite, which has a higher stability, with three dimensional perovskite, which is lower stability and a higher performance. That is what we are doing next slides. So, here is the data how we are doing. Again, just remember that you have a excess of lead iodide. This excess of lead iodide you are converting using um, this cation. I am just taking one cation, phytanethylamine. For students, this can be a huge opportunity to tune the cations. Can I have a, a flexible cation? Can I have a rigid cation? Can I have a interacting cation? So, this way the whole new field comes develops based on these two dimensional perovskites. So, here is the uh, data. 
So this is uh, the XRD data. XRD data has a characteristic features for the two-dimensional perovskites. So you have a, a peak at below five, five, uh, five delta. So you have a, this peak, which is a very characteristic of the two-dimensional perovskite. Three-dimensional perovskite is uh, around 14. By mixing the two-dimensional and three-dimensional, you do have a, this five and 14. On the contrary, if you look at the absorption spectral properties, this is pure two-dimensional perovskite, and the black is pure three-dimensional perovskite. The red is uh, two dim three dimensional perovskite followed by a two dimensional perovskite. Now, the, the, the main data to support my claim is comes from here. So now we have a three dimensional perovskite followed by two dimensional perovskite. What happens if I excite from the top side? So I should see the absorption spectral properties like this one, and the excitation, this gives you me the emission very close to this one. That's a this emission. And if you look at the, at the small shoulder here, showing that my laser is not only exciting the two-dimensional perovskite, also touching the three-dimensional perovskite, so I see a, sl a slight bump there. If you take the pure three-dimensional perovskite, you don't have this peak, confirming that I have a two-dimensional perovskite on the top. So can I excite from the bottom side, TO2 side, and by doing that one, in both the films, I have only one peak, demonstrating clearly I have a two-dimensional perovskite on top of three-dimensional perovskite. So, well, after doing this one, what is this? Good, fair. So look at the, the energy level diagrams. These are not the cartoons, and it's a real data based on the UPS uh, uh, measurements. So you have a HOMO level of this mixed cation perovskite, well aligned with the phenylethylamine uh, two-dimensional perovskite, a spirometer, and you can see the efficiency is reaching a 20% combination of this one. The beauty of this two, three-dimensional two-dimensional perovskite comes with the stability. So this is a pure three-dimensional perovskite. Stability is decreasing in less than 500 hours total. By combining my two-dimensional perovskite on top of three-dimensional perovskite, that's a blank space. You can see that one. It's a under nitrogen atmosphere conditions. It's relatively very stable. And then the field squares are encapsulated, but outside conditions. You can see the stability are both overlapping. In the case of without two-dimensional perovskite on top of uh, three-dimensional perovskite, this is under uh, with, uh, encaps without encaps with encapsulation, and this is with under organ atmosphere conditions. So this work is very beautiful work demonstrating two-dimensional two-dimensional perovskite on top of three-dimensional perovskite. So now, by using these different compositions, um, the compositions are shown here. You have a formidinium, methyl ammonium. Each cation has its uh, role to play. This is, if somebody is interested, I'm available till tomorrow to discuss. All these cations has a significant role to play. So let's take, uh, this is a, a recipe which I'm providing you, and this recipe uh, used in the lab, it's a 22.1% efficiency. What happens if we send to uh, some certification labs? So we sent to uh, Newport in, on 14th of November, very recently, and there we got 21.4 plus or minus 0.7. So showing that our lab measurements are almost similar to a standard laboratory in Newport. So this is the certified data based on the uh, normal configuration. That's a planar perovskite without TO2. So what did we use as electron transport layer? Very thin layer of tin oxide because tin oxide has a high conductivity compared to the titanium dioxide. So this is a new direction for the electron transport materials. So I come very quickly, I think I'm, so I have a few minutes more time? Oh. 10 minutes more. 10 minutes? Fine, okay, then I, I can cover. So what I will do is now you have seen the uh, perovskite, two-dimensional perovskite on the top. Now I want to do the same thing on the bottom side. So between the perovskite and the ETL layer. So here you can see we have designed keeping the same basic architecture, but included functional groups into, into the whole transporting material. So now my whole transporting material can talk to the perovskite through the sulfur groups to the perovskite iodides. And this increases your interface, and this interface, I didn't talk another drawback that's a hysteresis. So you can reduce the hysteresis significantly by having these functional groups which talks to the perovskite and reduces this hysteresis. But this data is still based on the dopants. This is not very stable. So now you have to do, now you have found the solution for this interaction, that's the thiophene. Can you change this whole transport materials so that they can go on to the surface like a, like a putting coins on the top, each other, like a disc. So you have to come up with a strategy. So we made a, uh, well, this work is again with Ahmed. So this, we collaborated on this one. So we made this type of disks. They can go onto the perovskite like a disk. And you have still arms 
fire fins to, to, to grab onto the perovskite. So here the data which I am showing is the previous data is with the dopants and this data is without dopants. You can see it's a 19% efficiency under the similar conditions, a spirovomatide um, without do with the dopants is a 19% efficiency. So we have created a new whole transport material which gives the equal efficiency but without dopant. So this is the uh, cartoon showing and the XRD data, GVAX data showing that the molecule, the way you have designed, they are just stacking on the top so that you are extracting positive charges uh, through this uh, stack. So the stability is significantly enhanced compared to your spirometer, and this data you will find um, in this article. So take home messages. So what you need is anti-solvent, controlling anti-solvent is important. And then a cesium incorporation is important, take home message. And you need 10% excess of lead iodide to create a, a two-dimensional perovskite. And if you want to increase and playing with the cations, particularly gonadinium, is very important. And with that one, I would like to thank all my PhD students on the left side. and the middle, we have a, a um, postdocs. And particularly, I want to mention Innes is here. She's in the audience. So she's working on the two-dimensional perovskites, and I have a collaboration with uh, international groups. And thank you for your attention. These are the funding agencies, and I will be happy to answer your questions.